Hey guys, thanks for coming to my talk. The title of the talk is Diversity on the Go, which I admit is not a very descriptive title, so maybe a more descriptive and definitely longer one would be Streaming Determinental Point Processes Under a Maximum Induced Cardinality Objective. Whew, that's a mouthful. Uh, I'm Paul, and uh, this work is joint with some friends from Microsoft, Akshay Sony, Yu Young Kang, Yajun Wang, Meho Parsana. So I would like to start this talk with a common question we face every day, which is, what should I eat today? If you're like me, you might feel overwhelmed by the sheer number of choices. And in fact, my biggest fear is missing out. What if there was some better choice out there that I could have spent my money on? So what do you do to solve this problem? Aside from seeing a therapist about your deep-seated FOMO issues, one strategy you could use is to order a set of diverse foods that cover all of your interests. So the question I want to consider for now is if I could only order K items uh, off of a menu, let's say, what should I pick? Now I admit I'm being very vague here. There are lots of ways to define diversity. For example, we could manually define feature sets, such as country, ingredients, all these things, we can make a list of foods that satisfies these criteria. And then we could maybe uh, solve some sort of problem for example, we could solve some sort of maximum set coverage problem where we choose K types of foods that cover the most set of criteria. Or perhaps we could embed these foods somehow in some sort of vector space and cluster it. And then we can select a representative from each cluster. Or perhaps given some embedding of these foods, we could choose K foods that have maximum pairwise dissimilarity. So for example, the dissimilarity in an embedding space could be the distance between these points. And it's clear the problem we're tackling here is much more general than just food. For example, instead of ordering food, we could be recommending videos or picking stocks. So what is the best way to solve this problem? Well, the first thing we should do is come up with a good definition of what diversity is. To figure out what it means to pick the K best or most diverse foods, we should have a good mathematical definition of diversity. And one definition that's gained a lot of traction recently is this definition of determinantal point processes. And it's really quite simple. Assuming you have n items that you're choosing from, uh, you must also have some sort of notion of similarity between the items. So perhaps you could encode this similarity within an n by n similarity matrix. Then, uh, given this matrix of n rows and n columns, the ij th entry is just the similarity of items i and j. So, for determinantal point processes, the claim is that if you want to pick k items, then all you have to do is find a k by k principal submatrix with the maximum determinant. And that's it. More formally, uh, we define L sub S as the submatrix of L with rows and columns from the index set S. To find K diverse items, all we have to do is find the S that maximizes the determinant of L sub S. So because determinant measures diversity here is called a determinantal point process. The point process here actually refers to the fact that uh, if you were to sample a set S proportional to their determinant, you actually get a probability distribution. So do DPPs actually work? Well, I wouldn't be giving this talk if they didn't. And in two recent papers by YouTube and Huawei, significant gains in practice were shown. In particular, for YouTube, 1.72% more watchers were found to be on pages using DPP-based recommendations, and for Huawei, by switching to a DPP-based algorithm, they were able to get 3.5% more downloads per user on their app store. So now that we covered DPPs, what is maximum induced cardinality? You might have noticed that the DPP objective from before has a slight issue with it. And that issue is, what if your similarity matrix has very low rank? Well, then L sub S for any S larger than the rank and size 
will have determinant 0. So it's quite an ill-conditioned objective function. But if we're thinking about diversity, this somehow doesn't make sense because we would expect picking more items to give us more choices and more diversity overall. To solve this issue, a new objective was introduced by Gillenwater et al. And it's called the Maximum Induced Cardinality Objective. Uh, the objective is a little bit less simple than the determinant, and is this trace of the identity minus the some inverse function of L sub S. But the key thing here is, even if the matrix L is low rank, this objective uh, is still well defined. So what are the advantages of this maximum induced cardinality objective? Uh, aside from being better conditioned than the previous objective, it is also monotone and subadditive. Uh, this means that it's better suited for the recommendation settings because the more items you get, uh, the more items you add to your set, the larger this objective gets, which coincides with our intuition that more items mean more diversity. And as we said before, it avoids the ill-defined solutions when the rank of L is low. So when we first thought about this problem, we were coming from the viewpoint of ad online advertising. We were thinking from the perspective of a large-scale advertising network. So can we apply it to online advertising? Well, from the online advertising perspective, uh, we have hundreds of millions of users surfing the web at any given time, and each needs personalized recommendations based on their browsing history. So we wanted to see if we could optimize a maximum induced cardinality objective. We wanted k events to summarize a user. Now each user stores thousands of events on a weekly basis, and to maximize an induced cardinality objective over this is unfortunately infeasible because it takes way too much memory to even form the DPP matrix for every user. So what we needed was a low memory scalable solution. In other words, a streaming algorithm. Okay, so now we have all the tools to formally define our problem. Formally, our problem is as follows. We have a parameter k, which is the number of events that we want to keep when we summarize the user or the number of foos we recommend, whatever. And because we want to only summarize recent events, uh, we also have this recency parameter n, uh, which we'll call a window size for now. So in this setting, a stream of items come in one at a time, s1, s2, up to the current time st. And at any time t, we want to return an approximation of the set maximizing the maximum induced cardinality objective. The items we can pick for the maximizing set must only come from the last n items we saw. So you can imagine a sliding window of n items going over the stream uh, with the most recent end being the most recent event we see. One additional assumption we make is that we can form the DPP kernel given some representation of the items we store. So when we record the memory complexity of our algorithms, we're just counting how many items we store. We're not really counting in, for example, the memory it takes to store the embedding vectors or other things that may come into play. So our contributions are as follows. Uh, we develop an approximate algorithm that uses only OK memory and k-squared update time when the stream is insertion only, which means we never forget any of the user events. So this is corresponds to when n equals infinity. When we have a window, for example, when we only care about the last 10,000 events, we have an algorithm that uses O of square root nk memory with O of square root nk squared update time. The algorithm has several nice properties about it, is easily parallelizable, and it's quite competitive with offline methods. So for the remainder of the talk, I'll give a high-level overview of our algorithm. Now, if you're familiar with the submodular maximization literature, a lot of this will be heavily borrowed from there. 
much of the overall algorithmic tools we use is uh, similar to those used in submodular maximization. However, in the paper, the approximation ratio we derive is unique to this maximum induced cardinality objective. So one thing I should say is that maximum induced cardinality is not a submodular objective. So standard means of analysis cannot be used here. On a high level, our algorithms consist of three ingredients. The first is a threshold greedy procedure. The second is a square root partitioning procedure. And the last is a parallel binary search. The threshold greedy procedure and parallel binary search allows us to handle the case when things are insertion only. And the square root partitioning procedure allows us to handle the sliding window events by facilitating deletions at the front of the stream. So how does threshold greedy work? Well, it's actually quite simple. We start out with an empty solution, and whenever a new item comes in, we just check the marginal value of the new item on top of our current solution. So if the value exceeds some threshold, if the new item improves our solution by some tau, then we simply add it to our solution. And the main thing is that if tau is chosen carefully, we get uh, quite a good approximation. In fact, we'll get a valuable set S, and you can imagine this procedure as filtering the input for valuable elements. How do we actually choose the right value of tau? Well, we don't need to choose the right value. We can just guess many values of tau in parallel. And the way we'll space out these guesses is uh, exponentially. So for some small enough epsilon in L, uh, we can choose the guesses 1, 1 plus epsilon, 1 plus epsilon squared to 1 plus epsilon to the L. And we show some choice of epsilon and L, which works as long as epsilon is small enough and L is large enough. Next, we have this trick of square root partitioning that was also used in the submodular maximization algorithm of Espado et al. So what is square root partitioning? Well, given our sliding window of n elements, uh, we handle deletions by sort of breaking it up into square root n size chunks and running a fresh version of the algorithm every square root n elements. So what does this do? It sort of creates a checkpoint every square root n elements so that whenever the oldest square root n elements expire, we can restart from the checkpoint. Now the algorithm is essentially complete. Each parallel instance of the algorithm will filter out some set of valuable elements. Whenever we get a query, we can either run greedy on this, the union of these filtered elements, or we can return the best filtered set. The full details can be found in the paper. So finally, I want to end with some experiments. We experimented with three data sets, the Goala geolocation data, the Microsoft user search data, and Yahoo front page data. Now, these streams were all quite large. The Goala had 6.5 million items, the Microsoft had 2 million items, and the Yahoo front page data had 27.5 million items. Now, in terms of performance, we implemented a simple version of the algorithm without much optimizations. However, despite that, we were able to get quite decent performance. On average, any query took about 20 to 500 milliseconds, depending on the value of k we're trying to choose, usually 10 to 30. Compared to greedy, offline greedy, uh, this is two to three orders of magnitude faster. And we know that offline greedy is typically the uh, industry standard to optimize these sorts of functions. In terms of solution quality, we typically achieve about 95% of what is achieved by offline greedy. So I'll end the talk with a performance graph of our algorithm on the Yahoo front page data set. On top we have greedy, and on just below it we have our algorithm. The blue line is another baseline that we show in the paper. As you can see, the streaming algorithm we came up with is extremely close to that of greedy. Okay, well that's the talk. Thank you, and I hope to see you guys at dub 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 2021. Bye.